Australia undoubtedly has some of the best environmental scientists and ecologists and conservation biologists in the world. And, you know, it's, it's a brutal and sometimes pretty heartbreaking game um, being conservation and ecological uh, science. But yeah, I take a lot of inspiration from, you know, collaborators and, and colleagues doing wonderful things. Welcome to Ecology Matters, a podcast from the Ecological Society of Australia. In each episode, meet a different ecologist, discover what makes them passionate about Australian ecology, what their hopes and fears are for the future of our natural world, and why they think that ecology really does matter. I knew I was going to be a field biologist. I was like, yes, this is what I want to do. I found that I had a real connection with the land in that area. I don't think I'm going to be getting bored in the next five years, that's for sure. I'm really interested in changing the world. <laughs> so yeah, I think it is going to make a, a big difference, which is exciting. I think that's really cool to see that can actually make a really significant difference. People are starting to appreciate cultural knowledge a lot more than what it would have been appreciated in the past. I'm, I'm really hopeful it's going to make a really positive change to what's going on here. Joining us this episode is Professor Ewan Ritchie. Professor Ritchie leads the Applied Ecology and Conservation Research Group in the Centre for Integrative Ecology at Deakin University. He was part of a team awarded the 2013 Eureka Prize for Environmental Research for work demonstrating that large predators like dingoes can affect the behaviour and abundance of invasive predators and herbivores, such as the red fox, feral cat and feral goat. He was also a finalist in the 2020 Eureka Prizes as part of a large national team examining the impact and management of feral cats in Australia. More widely, he has become a prolific science communicator, appearing regularly on television, in print and on radio. In 2021, he was awarded the Australian Ecology Research Award in recognition for his outstanding ecological research. Yeah, I became fascinated with ecology because of trying to understand all the way various species interact with each other and what that might mean for the environment and ecosystems. And it's it's one of the most complex sciences uh, in the world because of that. You know, there's there's so much going on, and that I found fascinating. And so, and then as I became older, I guess I also became aware of the plight of many of Australia's species, plants and animals, and fungi and so forth, particularly mammals. And uh, I wanted to actually do something about that. So uh, I thought, well, if one can have a career trying to sort of help conserve our wildlife uh that sounded pretty appealing and many people think of you as a mammal ecologist but uh that's not not strictly true is it even though most of the work that our group does now is focused on mammals it does bring in a whole range of other processes and and considerations including things like fire so i would now say that we are sort of more focused on ecosystems and and ecosystem management and trying to again understand how all the various components you know, so species interact with each other and how we can use that information to better manage ecosystems and have uh, better outcomes for biodiversity so conserve more species so we're living through i would argue probably the two greatest challenges that society's faced and that is the climate change crisis and the biodiversity decline and extinction crisis and they are interlinked they compound each other so we know that you know climate change is causing species uh, distributions to change um, in some cases populations to decrease and, you know we know of course the horrible event of more than 20,000 flying foxes spectacled flying foxes that died uh, in and around the Cairns area several years ago because of extreme heat events and we know that flying foxes have really important roles in seed dispersal and pollinating forests and so, you know, as we lose species, um, that can actually make the impacts of climate change worse as well. So we know that, you know, things like kelp, which grow rapidly, can um, help to capture carbon and then for, therefore also sort of help to mitigate climate change in a sense. So, yeah, it really does emphasise that we have these big threats. And then, of course, we have things like invasive species. We have uh, changed fire regimes in Australia post-colonisation. And they can interact, making areas more favourable potentially for invasive species to then impact native wildlife. So 
we can't take really sort of simple single species, single issue approaches to the environment. We really do have to, I guess, embrace uh, the complexity of ecosystems as difficult as it is and, and try and manage them that way if we want to have good outcomes. Because if we sort of take a simplistic approach, often it won't work and it may end up costing us more money. So if we target, as an example, a pest species, let's say feral cats or foxes and so forth, and don't understand how they interact with other animals in that same system, we can cause other problems. And so um, killing dingoes, as an example, which is largely done to help uh, livestock graziers protect their uh, livestock, that can in some cases lead to increased numbers of kangaroos which can cause problems of vegetation and then the species that depend on that vegetation as well. So, yeah, we really do need sophisticated approaches as difficult as they are. So that's really where our sort of work is focused now. And it's it's really challenging because it doesn't lend itself necessarily to easily controlled experiments. So in an ideal world, we'd have experiments, we'd have controls and, you know, everything would be easily manipulated and so forth, but the sort of work that we do that happens also at pretty large spatial scales out in environments in the real world, inverted commas, it's really hard to take that really strong experimental approach. So it does make it difficult. So we use a whole range of approaches, um, natural experiments where you have existing contrasts in management. So whether that be the management of dingoes are both either favourable for dingoes or not, whether that be different fire regimes and so forth. We use those natural experiments and then a range of tools, um, you know, camera trapping, uh, diet studies and so forth, and try and collect different types of information and different lines of evidence, if you like to test our hypotheses about how these ecosystems are actually operating. And hence, once we understand better what parts of the ecosystems are being influenced by our actions, we then have, I guess, the opportunity to pull on those levers, uh, you know, for managers. And I, I sort of say levers because, you know, managers have really significant challenges, both in terms of addressing environmental issues and the resources they have to overcome problems. And so if we can give them better information about what levers might be most important um, to pull in, in environments, they might get better outcomes. And as an example of that, we know that feral cats are a really big problem for wildlife in Australia, and there has been great success with things like sanctuaries and so forth. But outside those areas, controlling them is really difficult. And sometimes, you know, using poisons and so forth can work, but in many cases it won't. But we know that if we can improve uh, management of grazing so that there's not overgrazing of vegetation, which therefore means there's more complex habitats, likewise with fire management, having that, you know, more complex vegetation and more cover can mean that in some cases species can persist even in the presence of feral cats and other invasive predators. So it sort of emphasises understanding those different processes and different perspectives can help managers Mm. And on a related note, policymakers as well. And that's a, something that you have a strong interest in. Yeah, look, absolutely. At the end of the day, I mean, I think there's always a role for what people call blue sky science and, and you know, science for the sake of interest and, and discovery. And that's really important. And we know, you know, right throughout history that there's been discoveries that have come out of left field because, you know, we've been pursuing those projects. And of course, in a completely non-ecological example of that would be Wi-Fi. But if, you know, um, we also want to have um, solutions uh, for these big biodiversity challenges we have, I think it is really important to pursue applied ecology. And I guess that's a pretty strong emphasis of our own research group. But to make that information useful to policymakers, so, you know, to say here is an issue that you might have, whether it be feral cats, whether it be fire management and so forth, and there's a range of ways to approach that and, and giving them options on the table to sort of, you know, put uh, solutions, you know, in place. And I think dingoes are another great example of that where we have, you know, this pretty significant conflict uh, with livestock graziers, but um, through time we're now exploring different ways of managing that conflict and, you know, things like guardian animals has been a great example of that. So many people would know the movie Oddball, you know, the big Marama dog. Um, they can obviously be used to protect um, livestock. Likewise, donkeys are being used in some cases and so forth. So 
again, just emphasising there's a range of ways that we can actually approach significant challenges and then providing that information to policymakers. And I'll go one step further to say that it's not just policymakers that we should be providing this information for, but of course, it's more broadly the public. And so, you know, one thing that um, I spend a lot of time doing personally, and I encourage others in our group and more broadly to do is to really engage with the public about the importance of their their own science um, and how it relates to people in uh, in communities at an individual level, but also more broadly. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the value of science communication is really uh, being recognised more and more now. Um, what do you see as as being the value of science communication? Why is it so important and, and why do you invest so much time in it? Yeah, so I think my approach to science communication has really changed quite a lot throughout my scientific career. Uh, and I think it's probably fair to say that I in some ways have a luxury now that I can invest more time in science communication. So I think early in one's career, uh, it's probably really important in many cases to, you know, publish papers and so forth because you need to establish a track record, um, which will help you get uh, positions and, and advance your career. It also builds, I guess, a track record and recognition that you are an expert in your area. And I think that's also important when you come to uh, do more science communication that you can speak from a position of knowledge and experience. Um, but the reason that I do spend a lot of time, you know, talking about particular issues related to ecology and conservation is that it's a simple fact that the vast majority of research that's produced is read very little, including even by the scientific community itself, um, but definitely by the public. Um, it's not understood by lots of people. Um, and it's often just not used and and there's more and more of it coming out. So, you know, in some cases, in some fields, there's an exponential increase in the number of papers being published per year. And if one therefore thinks that, you know, if you write your paper, um, it will somehow magically be taken up by people and used. Um, I think that's a pretty false assumption. And that's a real shame because, you know, ecologists and conservation biologists and environmental scientists and so forth, they're doing a lot of really hard work can take in some cases years to complete that work and then to not sort of spend that extra effort communicating the importance of that work and making it as accessible to people and relevant to people as possible um, seems a bit odd because you're not going to get the full value of that work and I think the other important thing is that it's really important that the public sees that despite the massive challenges that we're up against, whether it be climate change, whether it be the decline and extinction of species, we are actually able to tackle these issues and we are doing that and we are having wins as well as, of course, unfortunately, losses. But we actually have the power at hand and the knowledge at hand to actually tackle these challenges and, and that's empowering and I think we need that for communities. So that's a really important thing and the public love it. There's a huge appetite for science and for science stories. People love stories and ecology, I think, is wonderful because it often involves, you know, incredible species in incredible locations and so forth. And so why would you not want to tell those stories? So I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of science communication. I do invest a lot of time in it and increasingly will do more, I think, as my career progresses. Um, but yeah, it's incredibly rewarding and uh, I recommend everybody invest at least part of their time, you know, in communicating their science because the value is enormous. And on a related note as well, in terms of uh, passing on knowledge and, and mentoring, you obviously are a leader in your research group and, and um, pro provide mentorship to a lot of students and early career ecologists. Um, what, what is it about that role that you that you find satisfying and what sort of messages do you like to pass on to those to those emerging ecologists? Yeah, I think it's just incredibly rewarding to see someone that you've helped mentor and train, whether that be an undergraduate student, whether it be an honours student, or a PhD student, postdoc, whatever level, to know that you've had some small part in their career development, but to see them go on and succeed and, you know, to begin to reach their own potential. I think that's just really wonderful and, yeah, um, something that I take really great joy from in my own career. Um, I think, you know, in terms of advice uh, for people, it, it's, it's really hard to just give one single piece of advice. I think being really flexible, of course, about 
what things you might work on and career opportunities, I think that's really important because uh, luckily, I think unfortunately, we're having a more diverse view about what ecology and conservation is. It's not just this academic path. There's a whole range of careers that can be pursued and they're equally valuable and important. So I think that's good. You know, there's a whole range of things that I would uh, advise for students. And the, the most important one, of course, is to, is to pursue one's passions. And that's cliche in many respects, but I think it is really important, you know, that it, it is a really hard career in some ways to pursue a college in conservation. Um, but if you're passionate about it, um, it's, it's incredibly rewarding at the same time. And I, I once heard Tim Winton basically say that um, you know that you're an author if when you wake up each morning all you can think about is writing like you can't think about anything else like that you have to write and that's a little bit how I think about being an ecologist is that I have a deep passion for conserving species but yeah understanding how species actually operate in in you know in the world and 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 the importance of that and how we can actually use that information for making better decisions for conservation that's what drives me and I think about it all the time so I think I've made the right choice and I think um yeah if if others are sort of likewise have those passions and I would obviously encourage them to pursue them Ecology Matters is a podcast by the Ecological Society of Australia a not-for-profit organisation supporting ecologists and ecological science in Australia. We acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. To learn more about our work, follow us on social media, visit our website or sign up to our newsletter. You can find links to these in the show notes. This episode was produced by Grace Heathcote and Elodie Compressi. The theme music is Glow by Scott Buckley. Lastly, thank you to all the ecologists who have taken part in this series and shared their perspectives on why ecology matters.